Hi there, and welcome to this lecture. It's time to bring out the big guns and talk about object-oriented programming in Perl. In this video, we will explore what are classes, objects, attributes, and methods, and how you approach object-oriented programming in Perl. To note, we will be exploring the built-in Perl's object-oriented system out of the box in this video. However, later in this course, we will use a module called Mouse to create and interact with objects. The Mouse module will allow us to build much better object-oriented code where we can introduce attribute types, validations, and other great features that are not provided by Perl's default object-oriented programming approach. Let's get started. First of all, what is object-oriented programming? Well, it's a concept that is based on structuring your data and logic in objects. Each object has properties and methods defined by their classes, but the attribute values and results produced by these methods are specific to each object. For example, you can define a dog class, and we know that dogs have specific breed, height, weight, color, name, and other similar properties. You can view these as attributes of a dog class. You can create an object of a dog class and set attributes such as breed equals Labrador, height equals 60 centimeters, weight 50 kilograms, color golden, name Fido, so on and so on. This specific dog, Fido, now would become an object of a class dog. You can add methods to your class such as get average speed, where you calculate the running speed of Fido using height and weight. It might be a silly method to have, but hopefully it explains of how each method would produce different results for each object of the dog class. If all of this sounds confusing, no worries. It's a tricky concept to grasp at first, but it becomes so much easier the more you practice object-oriented programming. Now, let's look at an example what we discussed being used in Perl. Now let's start by creating a new file, and we're gonna call it dog, as we discussed before. Instead of using pl extension for Perl scripts, we're gonna use .pm. For Perl module, we're going to write the package name, which is dog. So technically, module files are not meant to be executable, so we don't need to provide our system with indication of how this file should be run, because you don't really execute the module files directly. And as with scripts, it's good to return a truthy value, and it's especially required for modules, because you need to tell the use directive, as we saw before, and also this required directive, which we're going to look in next lectures, the compilation of this class succeeded. And if you don't have this truthy value in Pro module files, your compiler is going to complain. Now, the next thing we're going to use is strict progmas and use warning progmas because we still want to write better and less error prone code. Now, afterwards, what we're going to do, we're going to introduce a method which is called new. Now, this method is going to receive the first argument as a class. And this first argument is going to refer to the current package name. So before the package names were not that useful when we were working with script files, but now since we're working with modules, this is going to become much more useful and in that matter necessary because we will want to initialize instances of these classes with this package name. Now let's add some attributes we talked about before. For example, breed, height, weight, color, and name. And we're going to get all of this from this argument variable we looked at before. So basically this is an array that is going to hold all of these arguments passed to the new function. And the class package name, which is basically dog in this case, is going to be automatically given by the Perl module file. So let's remove that. And the next thing you want to do, you want to initialize self. And self is just going to be a hash ref. So it's going to hold a couple of key value pairs. And these key value pairs are going to be attributes that we're passing to our class at the time when we want to initialize a new object. So for example, we want to set the breed to be the breed, height to be height, weight to be weight, color to be color, and name to hold a value of name that we are going to be passing to this instance of class dog. Now the next thing we want to do, we want to bless our instance with this keyword bless by providing self, which is the hash ref, and the class, which is the class name, being dog. Now basically bless is going to do some inner magic, but you can look at this as that objects in Perl are glorified hash refs that have a name assigned to it, class name, that says that this hash ref belongs to this class, which in this case is going to be dog. And afterwards we want to return self. And we're done with constructing and setting the attributes of this class. Let's see how we can use this new package we just created. Let's go back to our script file. 
And let's try to use it with the same use statement we did for data dumper. But let's try to pull in the doc class. So if we save this, and now if we try to run our script, it's going to complain. It's going to say that hmm, looks like I can't find this doc PM in includes. And we looked at this include global variable before. This is where this global attribute becomes useful because now you can specify additional paths where Perl can find this module. So for example, and we didn't look at this keyword before, we're going to use begin. And begin block is basically just telling that this execution of code has to be done with the before these use statements. And again, we're going to look into how use actually works behind the scenes. But just know that when you are saying use a module, it's actually running begin block as well and putting it at the start of your script. So if we try to push something on includes array now, this would actually get done after we're requiring our modules. So with begin block, we're saying that we want this logic where we're adding new paths to the includes to be done before we are requiring this dog module. So I could do something like push at inc, which is the includes, and here we can provide the absolute path of the directory where this module can be found. And we can try to discover the current absolute path using our current working directory or modules, but I'm just going to give it an absolute path of the folder we're currently working from. So if I push this to the includes, save the file, run it again, it's not going to complain because now Perl knows from the includes variable where we can find this dog. Now, if I would remove this begin block and just try to push something on the ink, it's going to complain. And this is what I talked about before, because view statements are just using begin blocks behind the scenes. So requiring of this module actually gets executed before we're pushing onto this includes array. Now, that's one way how to use a module. An alternative is to specify additional libraries where you can find modules through command line. In this case, we could say Perl minus i for includes and dot for the current directory. And if you run this, the script is not going to complain. And if I remove the includes path, it's going to complain again. And I'm going to go with the latter approach because it's just easier and we don't need to add extra boilerplate. And we know how to create classes and set the expected attributes. And we also looked at how we can provide paths to tell Perl where to find our modules. Now let's look at how we can get an instance of this class. Now to get an instance of this class, we can say my dollar sign and dog. And this is just going to be scalar. That is going to hold a reference of the dog instance. And to initialize a new dog instance, we can say dog or package name and new. And this is this method we created in our package file, aka class file. And we can see that it accepts a couple of attributes so I'm going to just copy them over, paste them here, so we keep the correct order, and set them by providing these arguments in the new method. So I'm going to say that the breed is Labrador, the height is 50, let's say weight is 70, we're going to have a chunky Labrador, color, I'm going to say that it's golden, and for name, I'm going to say Fido, and save this. If you run our code, that looks good, there's no complaints, but nothing happens. And nothing happens because we're not really calling any methods or we're not accessing the attributes. So let's change that. Now Perl's object-oriented approach out of the box doesn't really come with accessors, getters, and setters. And the getters are pretty much saying, give me the value of an attribute on this instance. And setter would do the opposite. It would say, set a new attribute value for this instance. So let's add some getters first. And getters are nothing more than just subroutines, aka functions. So we could do sub, let's call it a breed. With a function declaration, I'm going to say my self equals shift. So we haven't seen shift working on nothing before. But basically, when you're working on Perl, you're always getting the current context when you're calling a method. So in this case, we could also write shift the current argument list. But in practice, you're going to see that usually it's just a shift keyword. Now, self is something new. It's not the class anymore. Self is actually going to be the blessed version of the class. AKA is going to be a hash ref that holds key value pairs of these values. So what we could do, we could return self and access key called breed. Now if we go back to our script file and here we print something like dog, breed, save this, run our file, is going to say Labrador. You might be wondering, but hey, can I not access it simply as a key on my dog instance, such as read? And if we run this, yes, yes, you actually can. But that's not a good practice because you're actually accessing internals of that instance. The proper way how you work with attributes, setting and getting them is through the setter and getter methods, which we just have introduced here. 
because the attribute names can also change or you want to add new logic later on and it's good to encapsulate your getters and setters in case you want to extend the logic or the attribute name changes so you don't have to go in every single place in your code and change the value of that key which is the current cell blessed reference now let's quickly add another attribute getter for example fight and i'm just going to return right here we save this go back to script and we're going to say height, just to see that it's working as expected, and it does. It prints out 50 to the console. Now, what about setters? Well, there's really nothing magical to it. They're the same as the getters. They are functions where you are modifying the currently blessed self-reference by overwriting the value. So you could say something like sub set height, and here you could expect to receive two attributes of self and the new height. And we're going to get that from the argument list. And what we're going to do, we're going to access self, height. I'm going to set it to height. And you might be wondering, well, didn't you just say it's not good to access internals by using keys on these hash refs, which are blessed selves? Uh, yes, it, it, it's a bad practice to do that. But as long as you're doing it outside of the actual class. So here we're defining these methods and attributes inside a class, and we're modifying them on the instance. So as long as we are not doing it outside of our class, this is perfectly fine. So now if I go back to the script file, and before I'm printing out the height, I'm going to say dog height equals 70. So now that we originally set it to 50, or maybe I'm going to choose a different number because we're using 70 for weight. I'm going to say 120 and save this, run the code. And we're still getting 50, and that's because we are actually calling the getter method, so we want to set the height. If you rerun this, we're going to see 120. Now, what about methods? Well, again, it's nothing really magical about them. You just introduce a new subroutine, aka function. So we can add something like sub, get, height, and weight. And again, we're going to get self as the first argument. We're going to shift it off from the argument list. And what we're going to return is going to be self height plus self weight. We save that. Go back to script and let's remove the setting of a height and let's just do this function name which is get height and get weight so if i call this which is set height and weight apologies it's not set but it's actually get save this run the script is going to return 120 because 50 for the height and 70 for the weight equals 120. i could change the height to 100 Save this again, rerun the script, and it's going to be 170. Now, another useful thing you can use in your classes is this default method called destroy. And you write it with capital letters, destroy. And here we're just going to print something out like print by everyone, exclamation mark, new line, and save this. If we rerun our script, it's going to print out 170 from this method, and then it's going to say by everyone. And the destroy method is basically useful for if you want to do any cleaning up in your instances before they get picked up by the garbage collector. For example, if you wanted to do some logging or reach out to a server or anything whatsoever based on different use cases, you can do that in destroy method. So object-oriented programming is quite useful because you can initialize different instances of a class. So if I have dog2 and I'm going to say that this is Oodle, height is 10, Weight is 10, or maybe 20, or color, something else that doesn't say just color. So white, and the name Bob, what we'll call Bob. We're going to have a different isolated logic per instance of a class. So now, if I say dog2, which is going to get a height plus weight, and I'm actually going to concatenate it with dog, and I'm going to be cheeky here, and I'm just going to access the key on the instance, which is the name, because we didn't introduce the setter method, but <laughs> don't do that. A bit of spacing, concatenate this, and the same for dog2. And let's change that to dog2, because that's our variable name. Save this, run the code. We're going to see two separate calculations. So for Fido, which is the first print statement, we get 170, so these values summed up. And for dog2, which is named Bob, we're going to get value 30 which is these two values summed up. 
And you're also going to notice that destroy methods run individually for each of these instances. Just to quickly mention, you could also be passing in named arguments as we looked at the functions where we were using subroutine signatures, or you can pass in hash or a hash ref instead of arguments in a list. It's really your choice. So this is it for this video. In this lecture, we looked at what is object-oriented programming and how we can create objects using Perl's default out-of-the-box object-oriented system. Note that we did not touch on inheritance and using roles to compose our classes, in case you have heard of these terms. These are a bit more advanced concepts that we will be looking in the future lessons when building classes with mouse, and we'll explore those concepts in more detail there. I hope you found this video useful, and I will see you at the next one.